So we use the goals model. Goals is a model that's been used, uh, developed by the Futures Foundation and has been used to assess impacts and do epidemic projections very widely. Futures did this work with us for free and they're going to make these uh, MSM adapted models publicly available. So uh, for those of you who are interested in sort of taking this work forward or looking at your own country, if we haven't modeled it here, this is going to be made available to the community. We really appreciate Futures for doing that. We have reworked the goals model uh, by doing a couple of important changes. Um, one is, as I said, adding these preventive interventions for MSM, but also expanding the risk categorization. So the way goals typically has worked is that MSM is a yes-no category, and all MSM are put into the same risk group. Uh, but of course, if you look at heterosexual risks, there's low, medium, and high high-risk heterosexuals generally are sex workers. So we've done the same thing. We've tried to break this down into low, medium, and high-risk MSM. The high-risk are sex workers. So male sex workers are very much in this model. Um, and then we've added an additional category for MSM IDU to be able to model those interactions. We've done this for four countries, Peru, Ukraine, Kenya, and Thailand. And basically, we've done it with three scenarios. So the worst case scenario is where MSM interventions basically stop, so something like a shutdown, which unfortunately we've seen uh, in a couple of countries. Senegal would be a good example uh, after the arrest there. And ARVs for the general population also start decline uh, in 2007. So this really is the worst case scenario. There wouldn't be preventive interventions for MSM, and ARV access would decline. We then look at the current scenario. So where are we with the best available data for these countries on coverage for MSM and ARV access? And we just assume that that continues. So it doesn't get much better. So all of our efforts continue at that level. And then we have a best case scenario. What happens if by 2015 we get full coverage of MSM? So wouldn't we all like to live in that world? Um, and we have enough ARVs to cover, by 2015, all the HIV-positive MSM in a given country. So that's the best-case scenario. Uh, and then we're modeling uh, for the MSM IDU epidemics 60% coverage in injection drug users. Remember that even with 100% with access, not all people using drugs want to get on substitution therapy or, or to get off. So, here is the first result from this modeling work. This is the data from Peru. And uh, let me just walk you through this. So what you have here is where the epidemic is. This is actual data taken up through here. This is an increase in ARVs, actually. And then projected out to 2015 if nothing else changes. Right? So Peru's epidemic is expanding. And that is almost entirely driven by new rates of uh, HIV infection in MSM. This is the worst case scenario. So if the preventive interventions for MSM stop tomorrow and ARV access declines, you get an immediate spike in the epidemic. And this is the best case scenario. Now, I want to point out to you, just so everybody is clear, this epidemic curve is not the curve of HIV infections in MSM alone, right? This is the curve of Peru's epidemic. So what we've changed here is we are now saying if we do 100% preventive intervention coverage for MSM and ARV access for all HIV-positive MSM who need it, we actually turn around Peru's HIV epidemic. That's kind of good news. So, the result, uh, basically, of that modeling exercise is to say much higher coverage of interventions for MSM will be needed to change the trajectory of HIV in Peru. This is the epidemic curve for Ukraine. Ukraine here is the second scenario. Um, it, of course, had a, an explosive epidemic. It has been in decline. I'm going to show you some detail. Um, just, this is the same curve, but just focused on uh, the part where we're changing. So we're going from now 2008 again to 2015. This is the trajectory of the epidemic in decline if nothing else happens, right? This is what happens if we stop uh, interventions for MSM. So it's worse, although overall still in decline. 
But this is the best case scenario. So you really can have a tremendous impact on speeding up the reduction in this epidemic with interventions for MSM. But of course, the IDU component of this is also key. This is what happens to Ukraine if you actually introduced the MSM interventions plus 60% coverage with needle and syringe exchange, I gotcha, uh, and methadone and substitution therapy. And of course, it's because IDU in this population have such a large backlog of lack of access that you see such a big impact here. Okay. So this is Kenya, and Kenya's epidemic, keep in mind, is a much higher scale here. This is hundreds of thousands of infections, so it's, it's a substantially larger epidemic. And again, let me take you into the tail of this where you can see what's happening. This is the current trajectory of HIV. This is what happens if interventions cease, and this is what happens with 100% coverage of MSM in Kenya plus the additional ARVs. So overall, this is in decline, but you have a substantial impact on reducing the HIV burden in this country if you add preventive interventions for MSM. So the argument, for example, that somehow, you know, MSM are a trivial component of African epidemics or something of a sideshow really is not the case. And then this is Thailand. Um, the Thai epidemic, of course, peaked in the early 90s. Again, I'm going to, oh, sorry. Um, let me just say this worst case scenario with the interruption of prevention and treatment really uh, is not good for Thailand. This is the current situation. This is what you get by increasing MSM coverage. And the reason that looks so modest is, of course, because Thailand already has really good ARV access for, for the, just for everybody. Um, but, of course, what it doesn't have um, is very good coverage for IDU. This curve uh, at the bottom gives you uh, here the additional impact you get from providing uh, prevention services, methadone substitution therapy for drug users in Thailand. Uh, so an argument really for needing to do both. This is what it looks like in better detail. Um, and again, the optimum scenario here is responses for MSM and for drug users. So what do we get? How do we pull this all together? Uh, I think we, we can say a couple of things with some confidence here. One is that MSM-specific interventions uh, really can have a big impact and in some settings can really change the trajectory of the HIV epidemic. They really have to include expanding antiviral therapy for MSM to have bite. We really have to do better with treatment. Secondly, we saw benefits for overall epidemic trajectories in all four of these regional scenarios. So this really matters for South America, for Sub-Saharan Africa, for the former Soviet Union, and for Southeast Asia, at least as far as the model countries we've selected show. Um, but I think it's also important to note that where the IDU epidemics are a substantial driver, um, it's really hard to have much benefit overall, even with 100% coverage in MSM, if that population is not addressed. So uh, something of, a, of an advocacy synergy for the folks who work on harm reduction. What else can we say overall? Well, obviously, access to prevention, treatment, and care for MSM is a human right. It's a fundamental right. We've heard that this morning very clearly from others. Um, I think the findings that we've put out here suggest that increasing coverage and access for MSM is not just supported as a human rights argument, but it really matters for the overall response to HIV. That is a critical part of this. And to me, the, the happiest outcome of that is to say that in this case, the science, the scientific argument, and the human rights argument are really in synergy. They really are saying the same thing. Um, that doesn't always happen in the HIV field, and it is tremendous when it does. There's a number of people I want to acknowledge and, and thank for this work. Um, Frank Safakis, Andrea Wirtz, who's here, our research coordinator for our center. Steph Baral, who did a tremendous amount of the data collection here, many of you know. Damian Walker and Ben Johns, who are working on costing out all of this. The next round of this, we hope to have it out in the fall, is also going to include what it would cost to achieve these gains. The Futures Institute, John Stover and Lori Bollinger, and then the Global AIDS Program at the bank, Robert Ulrichs has been our key partner in this, Iris Semeni, Leith Abu Radad, and David Wilson. 
And I just, if I might, take one more second and dedicate this talk to my late partner, Ed Luther. Um, he died in 1991 uh, before antiviral therapy, and uh, it's a coming on 20 years since his passing, and I have to say it, it is incredibly painful that in 2010 we still have so many men who don't have access to antiviral therapy when it's been around now all these long years, and uh, enough with young men needlessly dying. Huh? Thank you. <laughs>